everyone. Since we didn't get to go over formally the last bit of chapter 11, I just thought I'd record these um, notes for you so you can watch these um, during the time when I'm gone at my conference. So just to begin where we were left off was on some statistical information about uh, marriage and family. And so with this um, information with marriage, we know that people are older when they get married. So um, you know, this is a change with historical time. So around 1960, people were in their younger 20s, you know, 20, 22. Um, now we see people getting married a little bit later into their 20s, so around, you know, 28 or so. So this is a big change. We can think about what this means for the adult lifespan. So if you're getting married later, might be having children later, um, you know, getting married later can change a lot of things for a person. You could also be more mature, ready to have a more capable relationship. So these statistical changes can impact the individual level. Um, this great crossover is an interesting chart. So this is looking at the percentage of births of, from people who are unmarried. And so that's the blue line and the, um, or the, um, the, the blue bars, the little light blue bars, are the percentage of births to people unmarried. And we can see that that um, now is approximately 50% of all births are to people who are not married. So the actual lines here are showing the median age at first birth, which is in red, versus the median age at first marriage. So we can see around 1990 or so there's this crossover where people are likely to get married a little bit older than they are to have their first birth. So we can think again about what this statistical thing would mean for individual level um, people. You know, so we're having more children born out of the traditional marriage bonds. So that's an interesting thing from a statistical standpoint. Successful marriage, we all know what makes a successful marriage. So your partners need to be mature, a little bit older. You should have similarities with your partners. Relationships that are equitable, so pe both people are putting in to that relationship. You know, your equals, these are often more successful. And then obviously being with somebody who's on and commit honest, committed, and trusting is important. So I'm going to link this video of the Four Horsemen in. It's a short one, but I would definitely like you to watch that one because it's from John Gottman, who is one of our big relationship researchers, and he can study a couple talking, just kind of chatting about an event, and determine with up to 90 some percent accuracy, 90 something percent accuracy, whether or not that couple will stay together based on whether or not he sees these four horsemen. So you definitely want to be able to review that little clip. Um, as mentioned in class, this is the U-shaped curve of marital happiness, something that makes me sad to look at. And so what this indicates um, is that when we start raising kids, you know, initially we're pretty happy. When we start raising kids, this kind of starts to dissipate or decline. So we can see that around this middle life period, we might be down there at that bottom. So around 25 years or so of marriage, it can be a very stressful time. This doesn't mean that everyone experiences this U-shaped curve, just that it's something we can see on average. Then when kids leave home, it seems like we're starting to um, kind of enjoy life again. So I always feel like this chart is like the you know, commercial for not having kids, but um, it isn't a guarantee that this will happen to anyone. Um, family structures, here we just have some definitions. So in the United States, we often see nuclear families, only parents and children living together. But it's also common in very um, many other parts of the world, also, you know, relatively common in the U.S., for there to be an extended family situation. So in one roof, we've got parents, children, and then other relatives like grandparents, aunts, and uncles. The idea of being childless is um, something that we used to call people who didn't have kids as adults, so childless. But now we really say, um, especially when there's choice involved, that people might be child-free. So you can see this Time cover, this Time magazine cover, on this child-free life when having it all means not having kids. So again, we used to call these people dinks, double income, no kids. It was kind of an insult at the time, you know, you're a dink. Um, but there's been, you know, a greater societal acceptance for people who decide the kids are not for them. However, when we look at it statistically, we see that in 1990, about 4% of people said they'd never want to have kids. In 2013, it's about 5% of adults. So we're not seeing a drastic shift here where, you know, almost nobody said, I want to be child-free, and now half of the United States says they want to be child-free. Most people still seem to want to have kids or already have kids, but there is this maybe growing acceptance of being child-free, of making that choice. The parental role, we know that people are having fewer kids. They're waiting longer to have those kids. But it seems like this is not a bad thing. So a lot of times for older parents, they're more at ease. They feel less anxiety about this transition of parenthood. They feel that it's a good thing that they've waited a little longer. Another big thing we see on a societal level is this idea of um, two-parent households both working outside of the home. So 70% more or more moms are employed, 
but they still take on what sociologists call this second shift. So in this case, they're still taking on all of these house rearing and household tasks, or child rearing household tasks. So even when they do delegate those child tasks to partners, many times they're still the ones kind of the buck stops here with them. So they're the ones that have to kind of make sure that these things happen. So it can be a lot of stress for moms. Um, ethnic diversity in parenting, this is a definition for familyism. And so what this is, is putting the needs of your family over the needs of yourself. So maybe you don't really like that job that you're working, but it provides the lifestyle your family needs. So that would be the familyism. You're putting that well-being of family above the well-being of self. Some information about parents. So single parenthood, we know there's lots of causes for single parenthood. So things like divorce or having kids um, without being married in the first place. Um, we also know there's a lot of struggles with, with single parenthood. So financial and relationship struggles obviously are, are big, but it can be rewarding. So many parents who are single parents do feel like that time spent, you know, kind of being the, uh, the provider for their children is something that they value, that they um, really appreciate the opportunity to have been able to do that, that they feel that it's, you know, something that's, you know, their, their child's successful development has been a function of their own um, efforts. So it can be rewarding. Um, we can also see that about a third of couples will enter into a setting where they're either a step family, foster family, adoptive family. So with foster parenting, it's in bold here because this is really where we see bonding concerns. So um, this is something that's very common then to have these family kind of um, organizations, but the foster parents especially are the ones who have bonding concerns. And I think something really interesting too that's come out of this research um, is that individuals raised by gay and lesbian parents, these kids really are very similar to those raised by heterosexuals. So there might be a few smaller differences, but on average we're really seeing that, um, you know, kids you know, whether they're raised by single parents, gay and lesbian parents, that they're, they're at, you know, generally very, very similar in, um, you know, in their development. So we've got a little bit more statistical stuff here, divorce. We know that there's an approximately 50% chance once you get married that you'll get divorced. But this rate has been slowly declining over time. When you ask people why did you get divorced, we've got a whole bunch of reasons here. Um, infidelity by spouse is a huge one. Also a big one is just that they feel they don't, um, you know, love each other anymore. It's just some kind of incompatibility or grown apart kind of thing. But um, there's many other reasons that people can give. I think some of the ones that make me laugh here is this idea of men citing women's liberation. Um, you know, and then women also citing alcohol abuse by spouse um, and men citing alcohol abuse by self. So I think that's kind of interesting. But generally we can see that there, um, there are some commonalities in why people divorce. The effects of divorce, many times people will experience what they call a divorce hangover. So they'll have some kind of you know, time, like a physical hangover, where you're just trying to get over the effects of experiencing this divorce. For women, often this relates to financial problems. For men, it's more of a family, kind of negotiating those relationships problems. And people generally have better adjustment if they're more forgiving. So if you can kind of see, here was my role in the divorce, um, you know, I, I contributed to it in this way. I forgive my partner for their, their contributions to the divorce, but we generally see better adjustment. Of course, this isn't always possible, depending on the situation that caused the divorce, but, um, you know, generally we think that's, that's helpful for getting over the divorce. For remarriage, most people are going to wait a little while before they remarry, so about three and a half years or so. Um, there can be higher rates of cohabitation, so instead of getting remarried, people will choose to live together. We also know that when people do get remarried, they have a higher likelihood of divorce. We think this is for several reasons, but um, the big one is that they kind of know what they will and will not accept in a relationship, so they know what divorce is, um, how it works, you know, how to, how to go about initiating a divorce if needed, and so I just think they're not likely to kind of stay in maybe a bad relationship. There can also be a lot of other reasons, though, so they could have kids from those prior relationships that cause stress and strain, you know, it could be many, many different things. So this leads us to the very last slide for this, and we've talked about attachment. We talked about this way back in um, some of our earlier chapters with small children, but this idea that when we experience these early relationships, mostly with our caregivers, that these can perpetuate themselves in relationships as adults. And so what you see here in this chart is thoughts of self on the top and thoughts of partner over here to the side. So thoughts of self, this is kind of thinking of the self as being someone that's lovable, that's good, that's worthy. So if you have those thoughts that I'm good, I'm lovable, you've got these positive thoughts of self. 
If you think the opposite, that you're not worthy of love, that you're not capable, you have negative thoughts of self. And we see the same thing with partners then. If partners are people you can trust, you can love them, you can trust them, then you have that positive view of partners. Negative view of partners is the opposite, so you can't trust anybody. People are not worthy, they're not reliable. And so what we end up with seeing then is kind of this, uh, this chart, this box here. So if you've got positive thoughts of self, you're lovable, and your partner's also lovable, we call that secure. So your attachment style would be um, secure. If you have um, positive thoughts of yourself, like you're good and capable, but other people are not, you can't trust them, then we call that dismissing. So these are the people who trust themselves, who really rely only on themselves, who don't want to engage in a lot of relationships necessarily, may engage in short-term relationships. Um, for the negative thoughts of self, so if you've got these thoughts that you yourself are not capable, but that your partner is worthy of love, is a capable person, then we call this preoccupied. So you, um, in this case, you think you cannot function without them. So you're not capable, you need them. They are the ones who are going to keep you um, going. So these people become preoccupied with their romantic relationship. And then finally, our fearful category at the bottom. These people have a negative view of themselves and a negative view of partners. So they're not worthy of love, partners are not worthy of love, and this can be very, very difficult, if you might imagine, having this negative view of yourself and other people. So many times they then fear in intimacy. Well, that will finish up our unit for Chapter 11. So I hope you all have a great week, and I'll see you soon.